webinar about Plan S, about the implementation plan about Plan, uh, plan S indeed. I'm Wim van Saros. I've been asked to uh, host this, this uh, webinar tonight. And probably this is because about a year and a half ago at the uh, Royal Academy, we organized also an information and discussion meeting when uh, Plan S had just been proposed. Um, since you all signed up tonight, I am assuming you don't need an introduction to Plan S. It's basically the plan about or, or launched about two years ago by the European uh, funding agencies to promote a fast or accelerated transition to open access. And indeed, in the initial case, there were quite a bit uh, of discussions and questions about uh, wasn't this going too fast? What about books? What about uh, the fact that maybe we have international collaborations? How do you work with, uh, if you don't, if you have, if you collaborate with people who are not uh, under the guidelines of Plan S, et cetera. We're actually now one and a half year later. And indeed this is too, because of the, the fact that the European funders have taken quite a bit of time to think about the implementation plan, given all the feedback that they've got. And we're very happy tonight that uh, in collaboration with NWO, we're organizing this uh, webinar here tonight so that uh, first of all, Stan Gielen can, the, can tonight discuss the main uh, parts of the, the, the highlights of the implementation plan, which if everything went well, you've also got by email. But before I give the floor to Stan Gielen, I would like to introduce to you Johan Rorik, who has just been appointed and in, in the parlor of the uh, of the European Committee. He is a champion of Coalition S. He is sort of an ambassador for the new program. Um, Johan is a professor of uh, French linguistics in Leiden, but has, as I just said, he's been appointed a champion. So Johan will first introduce or give us an overview of the developments on the European scale in about 10 minutes. Then Stan Gielen will present the implementation plan of NWO in about 15 minutes. And then we'll have first a, a round of questions and discussions with them. Meanwhile, as Yolanda already said, there's also an option to ask questions to the speakers, but I would also like to mention that behind the scenes, there's also Hans de Jonge from NWO, who's also sitting behind his keyboard to answer questions in the Q&A about planners. With that, I'd like to give the screen to Johan. Johan, may I invite you to take the screen? Uh, yes, thank you for this nice introduction, uh, Wim. Uh, I, do I have the screen now? George, I sh I'll share my screen. Um, there you go. Can, can everybody see this? Is this visible to everybody? This is visible, Johan. Thank go you. On. Just wanted to make sure. So I, I will give you a brief introduction into, uh, to, pla to Plan S uh, tonight. Um, um, brief overview, I will t tell you a little bit about the basics, then the funders that we have on board, the principles that uh, Plan S is uh, based on, how we go from principles from, to, uh, from principles to implementation, how we work with key stakeholders, and then a number of other activities that we are currently undertaking. Uh, the basics are as follows. I mean, you know about this, but I just, uh, it's a brief reminder. It's an initiative by research funders to accelerate the transition to open access. Funders are using their funding as a driver for change. They are aligning their publication policies and requirements for funded researchers, but also for academic publishers. And the goal is to have all publications that are supported by uh, Plan S funders or Coalition S funders in open access by 31st December 2024. Publications must have an open license by then, and authors must retain copyright in this way. Funders agree to cover publication costs, and the policy uh, applies initially to Peer review journal articles only. Uh, open access books will be addressed, but only in 21 uh, 22. And uh, it, it is likely that also Dutch researchers and Dutch um, specialists will play uh, an important role in this. Um, in, uh, in this. 24 funders are on board, for, of course, national European funders, as Wim already mentioned, uh, not only national funders, but also European funders, European Commission and the European Research Council. Uh, but also inter big international um, charitable foundations such as the Wellcome Trust and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Lining Science across Parkinson's. There's also a global dimension. The World Health Organization has joined us in September 
and Jordan, Zambia, South Africa, and the African American Academy of Science, uh, Sciences uh, are also members. We uh, coordinate closely with other initiatives uh, in um, open access, like Americas Lielo, uh, African Open Science Platform. Uh, we coordinate action with Open Access 2020, that's the organization in Germany that uh, uh, addresses transformative agreements, uh, for, uh, changing subscriptions to transformative agreements so that researchers can publish in Open Access. Um, and we have coordinated action with the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. Now, strong principles, I said. Uh, so the basic principle is that research results are public good and should be immediately available so as to accelerate science. That's the basic idea. And that results in a lot of no's that I will be briefly go through before going to the positive. Uh, no more paywall publications, no embargo periods, uh, open access must be immediate, no copyright transfer, CC BY license must be applied by default, and no hybrid model of publication. We don't want hybrid because we think it has not uh, led to a transition to open access, unless the hybrid journal is under transitional arrangement with a defined endpoint where we can see or where there is a commitment that the journal will end up uh, in open access. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Pri the, now the positives, pricing contacts and publication fees should be transparent and reasonable. Uh, we also commit, the funders commit to support these publication fees uh, in, so individual researchers will not be faced with the bill. That is an important principle, I believe. There's now also multiple routes to open access compliance. So everybody will be able to publish in their favorite journals, uh, as I will explain in a minute. And we also have made a commitment to assess the research output, not on the basis of uh, quantitative metrics or on the venue of publication, but on the, uh, on, on the basis of qualitative metrics. And I know that NWO has already made the start with uh, implementing uh, such principles which are based on the, the DORA declaration and other such declarations. Um, let me tell you something about the routes to compliance. Um, first of all, of course, a researcher under Coalition S, who is funded by a Coalition S funder, can publish uh, in gold and diamond uh, journals. So those are open access journals and platforms where, where you can publish and the uh, funders will financially support the publication fees for the author. And that's the, that's the easy route. Then the, there is the repository route. Um, and the repository route is for hybrid and subscription journals. So if an author wants to pay, publish in a subscription journal, that is entirely possible. The only thing that is uh, being asked is that the version of record or the author accepted manuscript will be instantly available in a repository. So we don't financially support that because it's a subscription journal. There is no financial support that is necessary, but we do require that the version of record or the author accepted manuscript be deposited in a, in a repository. And we are currently developing policy that will legally enforce that. We will come out with that uh, in, in July. Uh, I think that's going to be a very important policy that we are putting into place. Then finally, there's what we call the transformative route. And this is a route again for hybrid and subscription journals, uh, where authors publish in a journal with a transformative arrangement and coalition and funders can financially support these, but very often they don't because under transformative agreements, of course, the, it is the libraries or the that, uh, uh, that libraries that uh, pay for the open access fees. As you know, the, uh, the Netherlands have a, a large number of these transformative agreement. I think they are the, the champion of a transformative agreement in, in the world, uh, which makes it possible to publish a large majority, and Stom will say something about that, I know in a minute, a large majority of publications in open access already as, uh, as of today. So these are the three routes to compliance. The only uh, You can publish wherever you want, you just have to make sure that the article ends up in a way that is that it is immediately available to all commerce. Um, we work with the key stakeholders. We, of course, work with research groups, to, um, such as the Academy of Sciences, to ensure we understand their concerns and to find ways to mitigate them. We have established an ambassador network of these people to, to um, see what the community thinks about open access. And we are also working uh, with a task force of early career researcher organizations to develop indicators and to understand how they feel that they, how they think they will be affected by by climate. I think it's very important to work with the next generation of 
uh, authors and researchers who are all in favor of open access, that is not their point, but they feel that an older generation of researchers who might evaluate them will not look as favorably on open access publications as they perhaps should. Um, we also work with learned societies. Uh, we know that a lot of learned societies publish journals um, and we, uh, we have funded a study to see how we can uh, fund the transition uh, the, for transformative model agreements that uh, and an implementation toolkit. A number of uh, societies are already implementing this. Uh, the, for instance, the Microbiology Society is negotiating these uh, transformative model agreements. So even for societies, there is a way of transitioning their journals to, to open access now. We also work with publishers. We published, uh, we launched a framework for transformative journals and transformative journals are in addition to the transformative read and publish deal. So th this is our policy to get away from hybrid journals. So in a transformative journal, um, the share of open access content must increase over time, uh, year on year. That is what we're asking. The subscription, cost, the subscription costs, of course, must diminish proportionately. And the journal also must commit to a transition to full open access and do so when 75% of the content is published open access. And interestingly, some publishers that we have been in discussions with for uh, over uh, a year and a half now have um, adopted this framework. Spring and Nature adopted the TJ framework. Uh, here you see uh, Stephen Inchcombe. Uh, the of, um, of Spring and Nature announcing this decision. Um, and uh, in addition to this, we are also uh, working on transparent pricing. We have, um, uh, we find that prices must become more transparent to build confidence between stakeholders, between, let's say, libraries and, uh, and funders who pay for often very high prices for open access fees. We want to see what is included in that price. And that is why we have uh, announced price transparency requirements. And from July 22, uh, only those publishers that give us insight into their price, uh, into their pricing, a breakdown of their pricing will be eligible for publication funds. And these are currently already being, imp be, being implemented by a number of funders. So in the next few years, we will see a lot more transparency into the finances of this. We are also building a journal checker tool that will be developed in order to uh, allow researchers to identify journals applying compliance with a plan S, a supplier has been selected. What this will do is it will allow a researcher to see immediately if he wants to publish in this or that journal and he is funded by this or that funder to immediately see what he or she has to do in order to be compliant with Plan S, in order to make sure that the article is available in open access. Changes here. We also see that the White House is considering uh, um, an, an order to, uh, to uh, mandate open access for all federally funded research. COVID-19 is completely reshaping the discussion. I mean, all, everything is in open access and nobody even thinks about it anymore. And we also see that Springer Nature and the University of California have agreed a memorandum of understanding for uh, moving forward on a transformative agreement uh, with Springer Nature. So uh, changes here. The, the last slide I want to show you and I want to leave it here is that um, uh, this study by P.O.Y. et al. Uh, shows that in 2019, 52 of article views are open in open access uh, uh, articles. But by 2025, 70% of all article views will be in open access. So the, I think that's a big incentive for researchers to publish in open access. You're simply viewed more. You publish behind the paywall, you're not visible. And that's what, uh, uh, on that positive note, I would like to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johan. Uh, I think we'll give right away the floor to, uh, to Stan Gielen, and then we'll take the questions and answers right after that. Stan, may I invite you? Okay, thank you, uh, Wim. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, thank you for organizing this, uh, this, providing this opportunity to uh, explain the implementation of Plan S, which um, has been consultant already with the uh, many. Uh, uh, groups in the Netherlands, including the libraries, the uh, VSNU, uh, the Royal Library, and many others. And I think this is a nice opportunity to give us feedback 
uh, on how we can improve imp the implementation of uh, Plan S. So basically my story has four sections. The first one is very short. How well is Netherlands prepared for Plan S? Then I will give you some information about the implementation plan for Plan S, some accompanying measures, and I will of pu pu the percentage of pu publications that are the result of NWO funding in the past years. And as you may see, there's a gradual increase up to 36.5% uh, right now. And you all may have heard about the deal that we have made with uh, Elsevier, including that uh, all the publications and journals published by Elsevier will be automatically open access, which means that we will reach over 80% uh, uh, quite soon. I want to focus your attention, well, please remember this 36.5% uh, this, uh, because I will come, get back to that later on in my presentation. Um, so what has been uh, has happen, happened in the past? In September 2018, Plan S, S was launched. In November, just a couple of months later, there was a publication on the guidance of the implementation plan. Then there were consultations in many countries, which have uh, raised many uh, comments. Based on those comments, the document was revised and the revised guidance document appeared in May 2019. And now we are presenting the implementation plan for Plan S. So what's gonna happen in the uh, future if you will get a, a grant by NWO? Uh, we have our Beleidsregel Open Access. It will be an annex to the uh, grant that you will see from NWO. And uh, we also will uh, refer in all our calls to this Beleidsregel Open Access. And what does it mean? Well, as of uh, January 2021, all the publications that are the result of projects awarded uh, on the basis of calls for proposals published by NWO as of January 1, 2021. So let's assume that we have a call which appeared on January 1, 2021. Let's assume that we um, uh, announce the grants that will be provided, let's say nine months later in fall 2021, then most uh, researchers will need a couple of months uh, to get the project started. And it will take a couple of months, at least half a year, I think, before the first results, if there are any results will be published, which means that this will affect all the publications submitted by the end of 2022, but presumably public, uh, publications that are submitted in 2023. What's the scope? Well, this refers to all the articles that are the result of research funded by NWO and by books. Um, let's first focus on the articles. Uh, Johan just explained there are three routes. One is the gold diamond route, where you uh, have uh, full gold open access uh, in journals that are registered in the, in the directory of open access journals. There is a green route, immediate, but that's a fine that includes immediate deposit in the registered open access repository uh, of either the author accepted manuscript or the version as it uh, appears in the uh, uh, journal. And then the hybrid situation, publication in a journal for which a transformative deal exists. And as you explained, we require that the copyright remains with the author. Regarding academic books, um, we have the gold option uh, where the book is published open access and the green option um, where uh, the uh, author that deposits the final version in a repository. Um, this refers only to the books which are reviewed. So books aimed at a broad non-academic readership, for example, let's say for a broad public, uh, uh, will not are not part of the deal. And, the, and we will not pay for uh, making books open access. And so the, the criterion is, is it peer reviewed or not? If it's not peer reviewed, then the author, we will, we will not cover any expenses to make the book uh, open access. 
The publication costs. Well, for many articles, they are in, already in covered by the deals made by the VSNE. Um, so, which means it's included in the deal that exists and you don't have to pay uh, additional money to make your uh, publication open access available. If there's no deal in place, then you can use your NWO grant if you want to publish your uh, paper in a gold or diamond journal. For books, uh, a new open access book fund was launched by NWO on June 1. And so we'll provide 500K on an annual basis to make sure that uh, we can uh, provide books uh, in the open access mode. Compliance. Well, open access has been the policy of NWO for many years, but we never monitored and there were no sanctions. So what we're gonna do now is, uh, uh, if you have a grant by NWO, at the end of the project, you have to report on the, uh, on your, uh, the results of your uh, project, which includes a report on the status of uh, all the publications. Um, NWO will monitor, and we require that you comply with the rules, which means you publish open access. In, for some time, and I'm not, I cannot be very specific now, but it definitely will be for one or two years, we will monitor the result, and if we see that, some, that there isn't, uh, that the publications do not comply with Plan S, then we will ask the authors to uh, retroactively uh, cor correct that version and put the author accepted manuscript or the paper as a published in the journal, uh, open access in a repository. If, Roth, if authors do not comply, we reserve the right to withhold 2.5% of the grant. So we really want to sanction this uh, implementation of Plan S. So how well is the Netherlands prepared for Plan S? This goes, shows an overview of most important uh, publishers. And yellow means these authors, uh, these journals fall in the golden uh, route. Orange means they are part of a, a deal of the phase anew with the publishers which means you can publish open access here without any problems. Um, this is the American Physical Society who didn't want to negotiate, but they allow that you deposit your, uh, uh, for your manuscript in a repository and Cell and Lancet are not yet uh, op uh, full open access, but they are part of the deal that we made with Elsevier quite recently and uh, they, uh, this is part of a transformative deal where Cell and Lancet will also be compliant with Plan S uh, starting uh, 2024. And Nature is just, uh, uh, just in initiated their transformative uh, agreement. Oh, by the way, um, if you, this is a, uh, I re remember now the 63.5% that was uh, open access for all the papers that were funded by NWO. If we go back to our uh, repository and check all the papers, then there were 7.500 papers published with funding from NWO in some way. And all these journals, 70% was published by a transformative agreement by the VSNE, and 11% with full could be published with full uh, the gold route. So we, this is already more than 80%. So you might wonder why, what's the reason for this discrepancy and the 6.3% that I mentioned to you earlier. The reason is many authors don't know that they can make the, their paper publicly uh, available, open access, because their publication is in a journal, which is part of the transformative deal by uh, by uh, the VSNE. So my message is that many of the researchers are not aware of the opportunity to make the pap their paper open access uh, immediately. So basically we're talking about 10 to 50% of the papers by NWO, which are not yet made uh, publicly available because um, they are published in hybrid journals. Okay, some concerns. Well, 
some people say, well, we can do without hybrid journals. Well, you don't have to. Um, Plan S doesn't limit your choice of the venues. Publishing in a closed or hybrid journal is fine, but we will not refund your hybrid IPCs. But you can make it hybrid by and compliant by uh, putting your uh, paper in a uh, repository like many physicists do. You might say, well, there is no open access journal in my field. Well, that's quite unlikely. There are 15,000 full gold open access journals. And if we focus on the Netherlands with the uh, deals with the VSNE, they cover up to now 10,000 journals. And 99% of the closed, which means the non open access subscription journal journals, offer a green option. So basically, there are plenty of opportunities to comply with the uh, Plan S requirements. Okay, now what about science and nature? Well, there are now, uh, nature mentioned that they are uh, open for uh, discussions to make, uh, to allow authors to post an accepted version of the article in the online repository. And Spring and Nature, I just mentioned, they are already uh, opened some of their journals uh, for open access, and they are uh, increasing that number every year until they have reached 75%, and then all the journals by Spring and Nature will be open access for all the public, uh, all authors. So this is part of a transformative deal. How about Dutch language journals? Well, change is going fast here too. Amsterdam University Press made all its journals open access and NWO just granted, it was published, it was um, published today, uh, at the humanity cluster of the Royal Academy, they will build a platform funded by NWO to make all the Dutch uh, language journals uh, open access. So that's where I want to uh, end my presentation. Uh, and that's open now for uh, questions. Well, uh, Stan, if I may, um, I'm looking at the questions and answer and Johan has already... Um, there we go. Yeah. Sorry, Stan. Um, Johan has already answered quite a few uh, specific questions, but there is one or actually two that are connected. There is a question whether you could explain a bit about the phase new agreement for covering the APCs, the uh, article processing charges, and a related question. Uh, the first question was by Ono Krasborn and the second by Adrian Soutevent, who says that MIT ended two weeks ago negotiations with Elsevier guided by open access principles. Was a deal like the phase new deal not on the table or, I am, or are MIT's principles more strict? Could you? Well, to be honest, uh, I was not part of the deal in the team of negotiations at MIT. I, so I don't know the details. Um, but uh, my impression is that uh, Elsevier, uh, let's say the deal that we made with Elsevier in the Netherlands, uh, in my the view is, is quite good because the budget that we pay will remain the same for the next five years. Um, all, like, well, except for the Lancet and Cell, all other journals will be um, uh, made open access. And for Lancet and Cell, there is a tr transformative agreement that they will be fully, uh, will meet all the criteria as of uh, 2024. So actually, I'm not aware with the details of the MIT. I know they uh, quit with the negotiations, but I'm not quite, I don't know why. Johan, do you know? Uh, no, I don't. I, I don't. I think, um, I mean, it's difficult to, in Elsevier, of course, still there has no deal in California either. And all I can say is that Elsevier is beginning to increasingly look like a very old company. I mean, seeing that Springer Nature has been able to make a deal with California and Elsevier has not. Now they have also lost MIT, which is another major, major player. I think they should step up their game. I think indeed that the deal that they made in Holland was an interesting one, but also because they could, were able to try out something different that hasn't been tried before in terms of these uh, agreements on, on data. Uh, availability. So I think that was something that was quite attractive for them and it maybe wasn't on the books in uh, the USA. 
but of course, I can only guess. Like you, I can only guess what the real, what the deeper reasons were behind uh, behind this. Okay, maybe we'll also take the following question by uh, Jacques Middelburg. Basically, all my publications are open access for those, uh, but for those that are first authored by colleagues working outside the Netherlands, the phase in the deal does not cover these cases. Will this be relaxed? So, what if your first author is not in the Netherlands? That's a question to me. Well, whoever wants to can answer it. Well, I would say um, it's obvious that uh, I explained that most of the journals, uh, it's not too too uh, hard to comply with the constraints by Plan S. Um, but uh, if the main author wants to publish it in a journal which doesn't comply, then uh, well the uh, the Dutch researcher is free to do that, but we will not cover any. Uh, we will not cover any APCs uh, to make open access uh, uh, possible. And actually, uh, it means that uh, in order to comply with the regulation of uh, NWO, um, it means that uh, the author should make it uh, available in a repository. And I want to add to that, that I realize this is a problem. I also explained that I expect that this will be most well crucial for publications that will be submitted in 2000, the end of 2022, 2023. And we are talking within, uh, with all our colleagues in Europe to uh, find a legal solution which allow all the uh, publishers, uh, all the authors to uh, have their own, uh, to make, uh, to, to maintain the copyright, the CC by a license, and also, uh, and thereby make their manuscript, the submitted manuscript, uh, available along the green route immediately yeah. without any embargo. Yeah, I, I, I would like to add to, to that that there is a number of possibilities there. I mean, uh, also, I mean, we are in a transition period. So this, the, this issue of authorships is, is one of multiple authorships, is one that needs to be addressed in the future, it's, it's also largely a technical problem, one that is actually going to be addressed by a technical uh, back office solution that is called OA Switchboard, and that is something that will allow um, payments to take place behind the scenes so that authors uh, would not be aware of it. This is something that is, that is being developed right now. Again, this is not something that is already available, but you know, we are in a period of transition, not everything can be done at the same time. But in principle, co-authorships also fall under Plan S, and usually it's, this could be worked out amongst multiple authors. I do think looking at the, the, uh, the questions, there's a lot of interest in the international dimension. But Oldenziel, for instance, stresses that the presentation is very much European based, even though I noted that uh, Germany is not in the list of countries that Johan showed. Um, but indeed, what about the US? And uh, there was another question that I think Johan already mentioned about China. Could you maybe reflect more on that now in the in this session? Uh, well, in, in, in the US right now, everybody is wait, waiting with bated breath, breath uh, for the decision that is going to come out, out, of, the, out of the White House. There has been this uh, OSTP um, request for information, uh, which was basically a request of information to see whether all publications uh, funded by federal uh, grants should be pub published in open access. The, the, the RFI was open uh, for a, 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 few, a few months actually, and the, the total number of answers ran about a thousand pages. So yeah, decisions should be forthcoming, but in any case, what you can see is that Whatever the outcome, whatever uh, executive order uh, the, the president is going to sign, is uh, has rekindled already the debate around open access in the United States in a manner that that, that I found quite impressive. So the discuss the discussion there is 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 well as we speak. Also, uh, progressively we will get uh, a number of other uh, major funders on board from the U.S. We already had the Bill and the Gates Foundation and. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of others that will, may follow in the, in the next few months. So the conversation, the conversation is already changing in the US. As far as China is concerned, I, I, I gave an answer in the Q&A. Um, China is, much, is a bit more difficult. Um, 
the Chinese Academy is very much in favor of open access. What we see uh, is that uh, China is also changing its uh, rewards and incentive system. I mean, before they used to give money to researchers publishing in international journals. Now they will no longer do that. And it's very clear that they're aiming to reinforce their national journals. Uh, they also bought a French publisher, uh, 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 Science, uh recently, which has a lot of experience in, publish in online publishing. So basically what they're doing is what they did with Volvo. They're buying the technology outside and then it, within three, four years, they will bury us. That is my expectation. Um, also, the reason that they are not uh, go so gung-ho about open access is that they are a bit concerned about the APCs, the, the, the prices, uh, I am told. Right now, China is still paying historical subscription prices, which means that the subscriptions are much lower there than they are, for instance, in the US or in Europe. And of course, I mean, if, this, if, if the, the same if these subscriptions would have to be paid in APCs, the cost would probably be much higher. So I think that's another concern that they have. I mean, at least that is, that is what I hear from conversations with Chinese colleagues uh, who are knowledgeable about these. Okay, thank you. Um, well, this international dimension still comes up a lot in the question, but I will we'll maybe do it also in the second round. There's a completely different question from Bram Kaas to Stan. In the end of your talk, you refer to plans by Amsterdam University Press to move all Dutch language journals to open access. Is there any difference in the NWO's policy in terms of the language of publication? Could you comment on why the move to open access is first applied to Dutch language journals? Ah, okay. Um, so um, let's say uh, most uh, emphasis and the focus now is on the, let's say the large journals which serve the international community. There's also a community in the Netherlands, uh, especially in the humanities, where they publish in uh, Dutch spoken journals for a small Dutch community. And we just want to make sure that also that community within the, in the humanities will be able to comply with the Plan S. And that's why we provided funding to make uh, all the publications uh, of th this community uh, open access available. And it's just a way to help them to provide some funding to make the transition. Okay, thank you. A completely different question from Pauline Kleingeld. What is the legal basis of the zero embargo policy? How does this relate to the Taverna project, which works with a six month period? Isn't yeah. that right? Good question. Yeah. So the, uh, according to the Taverna project, any author in the Netherlands is allowed to make his, uh, uh, his work publicly available. Uh, um, and so the, uh, the, tavern, the the issue is that in the Taverne uh, amendment they speak about a reasonable, a reasonable after a reasonable period you should, you should be able to make your uh, work publicly available uh, so the university have decided let we go for six months and that seems to work uh, uh, there is no legal basis for a zero embargo yet but I mentioned, and you want to explain that we are working now on a legal procedure to make that uh, zero embargo uh, a legal uh, part of Plan S. Okay, one final short question, and then we'll move on to the other speakers. Uh, a question by Raul Zarita Milla um, for Stan. Is the deal with, with Elsevier really Plan S compliant? There's more in the question, but I think this this can be a short answer. Well, I think uh, the main, uh, uh, to be honest, it's not fully uh, real uh, compliant with Plan S because uh, most authors still have to uh, transfer copyright to uh, Elsevier. Uh, that's the main difference. Uh, and we are uh, working on that. And if you, well, uh, the other side of the answer is that uh, Plan S describes that uh, all papers all which are part of the uh, transformative deals uh, are uh, accepted by uh, Plan S in, in such a way it is compliant with what we uh, set out as a trajectory towards 2024. 20, uh, but uh, uh, we additionally require by the end that the author remains the, author, the, yeah, the uh, owner of the material. 
we will we, we will actually or at least coalition s will come with a policy uh, on on this specifically on this by mid july uh, watch this space it will be interesting but i cannot divulge it now yet it is still confidential but stan knows about it but yeah. we have to be careful okay given the time i think we should now switch to the um, the speakers from the four different domains but um, Stan and Johan, there's still 29 open questions. So, uh, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to work a bit. And uh, probably Hans de Jonge can also help you. But of course, you also want to listen to the comments. Let me first invite Joost Rake, who is a professor of organic chemistry at the University of Amsterdam, to take the floor and give his reflections from the domain of the natural sciences. Joost. Joost, I don't hear you yet. There you are, I think, Joost. Yes. Yeah. I'm unmuted five times now, so you should be able to hear me now. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Bim, for uh, introducing me and uh, also for the opportunity to reflect on the um, the plans for the implementation. Uh, so uh, I will reflect uh, uh, from the natural sciences side. Uh, and I have divided uh, in, in three parts. So general con considerations and some of these questions already were discussed. So, um, <clears throat> as mentioned before, if Plan S fails uh, to make it a broad supported community, so if we fail to include also uh, US, China, Germany and other important countries, then I, uh, I think Plan S in itself is failed because it probably will divide our community rather to unite our scientific community. And I think uh, considering all the uh, things going on in the world that the, the scientific community should work on, on un, un, unite each other. Uh, a second uh, general uh, thing is, is that currently large companies, uh, they contribute to publishing costs via licenses, so they have licenses. But if everything is open access, then they will no longer contribute, meaning that the academic world will, will have to pay for all the costs, so costs will increase. And also, uh, what is a little bit annoying is that data from subsidized research at companies is not open access. So this means that researchers at companies will be treated differently than researchers uh, in universities, yet they, give, they get the same type of research funds from the government, so from government money. Another thing that still is a sort of uh, concern is that pay to publish is in the basis a conflict with quality control. Uh, and of course, there is a, a, a DOAJ, a Directory of Open Access Journals, which sort of controls the quality of these journals, but I think this is not a sufficient control mechanism. Uh, so the, the, the control mechanism that now is in place is, is uh, much stronger. And then another general uh, command is that uh, open access, we support that. And we want to reduce also publication costs because the more we reduce publication costs, the more is left for, uh, for research. But these two are different challenges and they not necessarily need to be mixed in one plan. Um, <clears throat> then some more specific concerns and some of them were already mentioned in the Q&A session. Uh, so, especially in natural sciences, we uh, often have large collaborations which uh, involve multiple uh, uh, PIs from different countries, especially US and China, uh, Germany. And the question is, what are the rules if you have a collaboration with these type of uh, uh, scientists, uh, if you want to publish? Because the Americans, for example, don't want to publish open access, they just publish in their own journal. 
um, are we, let's say, uh, still allowed to have these joint projects and joint publications, which are so important for natural sciences? And a very other uh, important issue is, is that the natural sciences are very well organized in the learned societies. So for chemistry, we have the Kahn Survey, for example, and the Royal uh, Society of Chemistry, and then the ACS, the American Learned Society. And many journals are controlled by these learned societies. So, so uh, natural sciences publish uh, a lot via these type of journals. And um, the question is, currently they are, uh, there are hybrid transformative deals with uh, some of these uh, uh, journals. But the real question is, how is that going to change in the future? And so this hybrid that is combined in transformative deals uh, stops probably after the deal uh, is uh, ended. Yeah? Or are these continuously renewed? And so in other words, if you want to publish in these Wiley journals that are supported by our learned society, uh, are there uh, agreements on agreements on agreements, which mean that they, they will stay hybrid and, uh, hybrid and we can just publish open access according to the deals they make with the Venus Zoo. And then we have an issue with the copyright uh, for authors because some authors just don't allow uh, these type of copyright. So, so, uh, so why is it so important to have the copyright at the authors, whereas it may be more um, uh, interesting or more important to, uh, to publish open access and have the copyright at the, the, the publisher, they may be even better uh, qualified to protect these copyrights than, than single individuals, uh, single researchers. So we don't see the, 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 which problem this copyright solves. And on the other hand, we see the problems that uh, are associated with this because some of these uh, journals don't allow this. And then a, uh, 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 there's an emphasis on CCBY licenses, which in some cases may uh, cost additional thousand euros. And the question is, uh, who is going to pay for this and, and why? Why don't we just publish under CCBY and D license, which is uh, to us just a minor difference? And uh, cost for publishing on, uh, on projects, uh, so it was uh, specifically mentioned, you can uh, use the, the cost of projects, but the question is, is this at the expense of the other part of the project or do you get additional money for this uh, uh, publishing costs uh, it, um, on, on top of the current normal funding scheme. So these are uh, the reflections according uh, uh, to natural sciences that I collected from uh, different uh, scientists. So with this, uh, I will give back the word to uh, Wim. Thank you, Wim. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Joost. Um, we'll continue right away with Fritz Rosner. We're we'll collecting now the feedback and then we'll get back to it in the, uh, in the full discussion. Um, Fritz, may I invite you to take the screen and have your reflections. Fritz is a professor of epidemiology at the Leiden University Medical Center. Yeah, thank you. And I hope I can be heard now. I believe I can. Huh? Yes, you can. Uh, I have no slides. I just want to make a few comments. Um, and I do realize that we as four people giving reflections um, are here to start the discussion, but I see already 29 questions again. Um, so I'll try to be brief because I, I believe the discussion is going well and maybe this format is also making discussion easier for a lot of people. Um, it's a bit of a daunting task to represent the biomedical field, which uh, globally publishes half, half of all publications. Um, and so there will be many opinions and in no way can I say that we feel this or, or we feel that. Uh, so I'll just give some expressions of what I feel that I, I have heard uh, around and uh, the main um, observation I have is that there, a, there is a mainly a lack of knowledge. Uh, people don't know exactly what's happening, when it's happening, what it means. Um, and of course, lack of knowledge will often lead to, to fear and concern. So that's why uh, it's very good that we are addressing this issue. I have to keep on addressing it. 
And we should also realize that the people here are browsed through the list. And now quite a few of them are the people who are in the knowledge and are not the, the average researcher, if that person would exist. Um, now, um, I've explicit, we've explicitly been asked not to talk about Plan S itself, but its implementation. Um, but still, it, I think it's good to realize that there are still a lot of emotions around it, and that's part of it were addressed in the previous speaker, but I think we have to keep on addressing them, and I will also mention them. And also, we should be very careful in not divide the field or dismiss people. I just already heard something about older and younger research, and I think that kind of um, dismission, dismissal or division is not fruitful. We should not do that. We should keep addressing these issues and explaining. Um, why are there emotions? Well, the, the emotions are that scientists feel sometimes, researchers feel used for an ideological game, uh, aim, goal. Um, one is open access is good, and some people very wonder why. Is it really necessary that my neighbor reads my articles and would she really understand them or he? And the second one, the main hurdle is that gold open access is required, which of course is opposite to the first, um, uh, the first aim, because hybrid or any type of open access is makes it available to everybody. Um, so there's part of this uh, this emotion is still around that needs to be addressed continuously. On the other hand, uh, there are also people, and many of us, I think, if not most of us. I feel that we do realize that we work with taxpayers' money or with uh, money from charitable funds, which certainly in the medical field is an important contribution. And, uh, and of course, we see the need to give back and, and to do outreach. And that can not only be done by Twitter, but should also be done in, in publications. Now, what are the outstanding concerns? Um, I think the main one is, is, is the freedom to choose a journal um, of one's liking. And that is not only that some are very prestigious, uh, like they have been mentioned, Nature and Cell, uh, for the more fundamental uh, biomedical scientists, the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, and JAMA for, um, for the clinical researchers. Some are also very specific. Um, suppose you, do, you have your career in bicycle safety. I imagine there's a journal of bicycle safety, but maybe there are not so many of them, and maybe you want to have that one journal. And um, also very important that some journals have proven quality. And uh, I've been editor for many years of a learned society journal in the blood correlation. And um, then clearly a journal is a, is a club to which, to with, uh, to which people wish, wish to belong. Um, and, and if you di disrupt that club feeling, uh, you might lose something. And it is a club very often because these journals have a long history, not only impact factor and all that, but have a history of good editing, um, good producing, reliability. Um, and and um, of course, there are many open access journals, but I'm a member of the Council of COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics, and we vet journals that can become members. Um, and then among the open access journals, it's really tough to uh, find the good ones among the plethora of uh, journals that are really horrible, if not just fraudulent. Um, so that is a, the, the freedom to choose, the academic freedom per se is a big issue. Um, then down to earth, money has been uh, mentioned uh, quite a few times. It's still not completely clear to me how it works. In, in one way, you could see it economically as just another payment system. Um, but now you wonder if, if not the researcher, if you're reimbursed, but then the institution is, at science as a whole, is paying double by subscriptions and, um, uh, and uh, publication fees for open access journals. So are we not losing money to do, to do research? That's a question. And the last one I had is about, uh, oh, in the medical field, we're quite prolific in authorship. Um, so there's to worry about international collaborations. And um, I think that has been addressed in some of the questions already. So that is basically what I want to say. I'll keep it short. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Fritz. Let's move on right away to Birgit Meyer, who is a professor in religious studies in Utrecht. Birgit, may I invite you to take the floor? Yes. Am I audible yes. and visible? Yes, you are. And we see you and you hear you. OK, that, that is uh, uh, very good. Uh, yes, I'm very happy that we have this discussion on the draft implementation plan. 
I do not speak for the humanities, but I would say I speak from them. The, hum uh, the humanities are a very diverse uh, field. Um, I have intervened in uh, debates before, but I want to assert that I'm very much in favor of open access and publish a lot uh, open ex access. But I also want to repeat what I said before, that of course the introduction of this new regime involves a huge transformation. And I do see still some worries about the impact for the quality of our research and publishing in uh, the SSH um, uh, domain. I'm very happy about uh, the fact that the draft implementation plan uh, really takes time. That has also been recommended. So it will only pertain to calls published after 1-1-2021. I'm also very happy that a beginning is made to include books. And I'm also happy that there is a concomitant attention to the need to change the evaluation of the quality of research standards, including a narrative CV and all that. Still in the implementation plan, I do see some problem. I still see a kind of one side fits all attitude, which is problematic. And we see that already from the previous speakers. Once you look at the implementation plan from below, you get a somewhat different picture. Here, I want to signal two problems. The first problem, concerns the green route in hybrid journals. And it is true, as the implementation plan also asserts, that this route is not forbidden. The problem, however, is that it is very difficult to be compliant. Stan Gieden just said 99% um, of the journals offer a green option, but they offer a green option and not the green option. It has already been mentioned, there is the problem of embargo and not all journals accept immediate self-deposit of AAM or VOR. There's also a problem of the rather complex technical requirements. And then there is the problem of licenses. The implementation following Plan S opted for CCBY as the default and CCBY and D just as an exception and only on the basis of motivated request. I recognize that here one has tried to accommodate criticisms, especially from my field, from the humanities, but I think this is problematic because it creates the impression that humanities and social sciences to some extent deviate from the default. And that in a way is my problem um, anyhow. I uh, also find it still puzzling that CCBYNC is not even accepted because it is said that commercial is not possible to define. But then let us try to define, for it is problematic to, in a way, uh, pay, um, make everything available for free to allow others to perhaps make a lot of money with our stuff. I still can't get my head around that, and I would be very much in favor of accommodating uh, CCBYNC. Uh, this is even more problematic as many journals that now allow for green do not allow for CCBY. So I see an impasse here. This also pertains even to many of the journals that are with the big five and are already part of transformative agreements. I have many examples in my immediate sphere of work, but this very point has also been emphasized in a very substantive report by the British Royal Historical Society in October 2019, where they showed that, yes, almost 40% of sample journals do offer self-deposit of AAM with zero embargo, but still the CCBY license is not accepted. So I see a danger here of eventually arising two little publication possibilities in our field. So my plea is, please, please, please accept a longer embargo and accept more licenses that will make it much more easy for our field to embrace Plan S. Then more briefly, my second point, which concerns the transformative agreements. Of course, as has been explained, NWO is normally not directly involved, except now um, for Elsevier. This is, of course, incredibly comfortable now for researchers from uh, uh, universities in uh, the Netherlands. However, I very much wonder how to make sure and monitor that all these journals will be compliant after the end of the deal for the very same publishers do not allow journals to be compliant with the green route as uh, defined by Plan S right now. How would one address this? How will the final transition by funded AP, uh, uh, be funded? APCs seem necess necessary. So there is a big danger I see in our field 
especially in the context of scarce funding, that it may be difficult uh, for us to publish, perhaps also to publish for emerity and so on. How to get the funds for the APCs? Will it all perhaps become much more expensive for the subscription rates for journals in the humanities are often very, very low? I see a big danger, in fact, um, uh, for our um, field here that everything will become more expensive. And related to the, this, I also see problems with regard to the global scale of publishing. And I fear with many others that full um, open access will enhance global inequalities. Um, full open access based on APCs. So I would want to urge uh, NWO and KNRW uh, to ask VSNU to invest more in true open access journals. So in the route one, perhaps also in the field of SSH, so as to avoid APCs. And I saw that this is also a required or a, a plea made uh, by the uh, open access journals uh, assembled under the Frontier uh, platform. I would like to leave it at this. Okay, thank you very much, Birgit. Then we'll move right away to Klaartje Mulder, Professor of Demography from Groningen. Klaartje, could you take the floor? Yes, um, I assume I'm now uh, can be heard and seen. Yes, we hear you. Thank you. We yeah, thank you very much, Wim, for uh, giving me the floor. Uh, first of all, like uh, Birgit and uh, Frit Fritz, I'm not speaking on behalf of a whole domain. Uh, that would be uh, far too much but I'm speaking from the social sciences. And of course, many of my points had already been raised. So I'm looking through my notes, what I can still add. Um, I think I would like to raise one issue that Fritz also mentioned, the quality of a journal that was mentioned as something that is no longer a valid criterion for um, uh, assessing the quality of research. In fact, I think in the social sciences, the quality of a journal is a huge thing. Um, not, not because of impact factors, but because of the quality of the reviews, of the quality of the editors, of the acceptance rates. So there are journals that are seen as much better journals than others. And I think I, it's hard to imagine that I would no longer uh, recommend my PhD students to uh, try and submit to a high quality journal um, because it has to be open access. Um, another point is the um, transformative agreements. And first of all, I'm really happy that it's now clear that uh, journals in the transformative agreements are uh, compliant or that by using such a journal, you can be compliant. Uh, because many of the high quality journals that I just um, mentioned are in the transformative agreements. Um, but I think that transformative agree agreements can sometimes be uh, problematic. Um, and let us also admit that if there is a journal, a, a hybrid journal, and you pu publish via the green route, that is not to be preferred. It's so much better to have the, uh, the article immediately open access via the journal itself. Um, now, with, uh, from colleagues, I heard different, two different stories that I think show that the, the transformative agreements can be problematic. One colleague had submitted a journal, uh, an article to an Elsevier journal and found out that it had not been published open access by coincidence. She, she had clicked the right buttons, she thought, but it turned out it was not published open access. And then the argument was, well, this is not a regular article, but a discussion article. She wasn't even aware that she had clicked a button for discussion article, but the journal or she uh, unknowingly had uh, uh, assigned this, the title of a discussion article, and then it was not published open access. So our university is still trying to get this settled. Another story I heard was that um, uh, at the end of 2019, there was a message from a journal, and I think it was a Springer journal, where they said, well, we've now reached the maximum number of uh, open access publications under the VSNU agreement, 
and we can no longer accept uh, open access articles. I don't know how that ended, but if that can be, if that can happen, that is something to uh, really worry about. Uh, then I think one of the other speakers already mentioned the sustainability. So how do we know that the agreement will uh, remain in place? Um, and there's this issue of scholars working for other institutes. Um, Joost mentioned companies, but of course there are also uh, institute like uh, KNW institutes, uh, NWO institutes, uh, other research institutes like uh, Social Cultural Plan Bureau. Um, they might, I'm not sure if they can get funding from NWO, but some other institutes can. And then NWO doesn't pay for the fee for the hybrid journal, journals because it's double di dipping. And then they end up with um, with articles that look like they're not open access and they have to go via the, to, via the cumbersome um, green route. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Klaatje. I can't turn on my video, but um, let me already start. I, we had many comments and I also see many, ah, there we go. Um, Many comments in the uh, in the questions. If I try to cluster them a little bit, I see certainly the international dimension still come up very much. Um, some express it in terms of be aware that uh, Plan S might divide the community. Uh, there's also the question, of course, about uh, Germany, the UK, uh, United States, and China joining, and uh, the whole plan failing if they don't. Secondly, there is there we had quite a few questions about the, the payments. Um, that is, if you can uh, <clears throat> get the money back from NWO, does that mean that NWO has less money for the uh, for funding projects? That is for the research. There's also an issue brought up in some of the questions by Bas de Bruyne about the poor countries. How are they being reimbursed? Um, so I think we should pay some attention to the payments. Then the issue of the learned societies. There's quite a few issues about the CCBY uh, uh, requirements. And then the issue brought up also by Fritz on the freedom to choose the journal and the quality of the journal that also Klaatje was bringing up. Since we haven't had so much about payments, may I invite Stan to first reflect a little bit on how does it go with the, uh, the payments that um, where does the money come from that NWO will be using to reimburse people that, that publish in open access journals? And what about the poor countries? Okay, uh, so let me focus on the two issues. Uh, first of all, where does the money come from for NWO? And then the other one is on the poor countries. Uh, uh, well, obviously we will not get an, uh, uh, a larger budget for uh, uh, paying APCs. The point is that uh, we uh, believe that uh, open access will uh, not uh, require more money, but will save money. Uh, one example for Elsevier, we have uh, now set a limit to what we pay, the subscription fees, and we get additional to that, we get free open access. So my point is that uh, in general, we will not spend more money, we will spend less money. And the question is, does NWO get more money, yes, no, answer is no. But I think finally we have to, uh, and that is gonna happen in every country, we have to decide how we are gonna pay for the, let's say the publishing as a whole. Now the uh, libraries of universities are paying quite a lot of money. I think we have to sit together uh, how we uh, deal with open science in the future. Um, the point that we have made with Plan S is we always stated the funder will pay, which means Actually, I would have preferred to phrase another way, the author should not pay. And it's up to the country because every country is organized in a different way. The publishers and the universities and whoever, uh, maybe the, uh, the government should make sure that the, uh, the uh, researchers should not uh, pay for all the additional the APCs. About poor countries, um, uh, Underdeveloped countries already have a reduced subscription fee for many of the publishers, and they will get receive uh, reduced APC uh, costs 
in the new model. That's also why South Africa is jo has joined uh, coalition S. So sure, uh, I, we realize that many underdeveloped countries will not have the funding to pay uh, for APCs. But yes, we've tried to find the same solution as we did uh, for the uh, subscription fees of the journals. I think Johan also would like to add something to this. Yes, I, I, I would like to dispel this, this idea that it's going to cost NWO more. I mean, most, uh, I mean, if you look at the chart that Stan showed, and if you look at the figures, what you actually see is that 70 to 75% is covered by these um, uh, transformative agreements. And, and those are largely paid for by, by, by the libraries, by, by all of Holland, not, not just NWO. Right? I mean, what NWO pays for, if I understand correctly, but Stan should correct me, what NWO directly pays for is gold APC fees. That, that, that's it. And, and that is like maybe 10, 15 percent. So that's a, that's a relatively small percentage of the total cost of open access publishing in, in, in the Netherlands. So I, I do believe that that is quite feasible. And then another 15 percent can be covered by uh, deposition, deposition in a repository. I mean, we are really very, very close to realizing full open access in, in, in the Netherlands. I, I, I think I cannot stress that enough. And I really think, I mean, I'm sorry, Birgit, but I'm also from the humanities. And I really think that we should, instead of, you know, complaining about how hard it is to publish in open access, maybe we should, you know, simply set up open access journals ourselves, like I did, for instance. I mean, it's quite possible to set up open access journals. Kana and NWO are now making that possible with the new platform that is being developed. You know, let's let's get out there and do it, if we are also in favor of open access. Yeah. Yo Johan, I, I don't complain. I have been asked to comment I'm on not, the implementation plan, and complain. I see certain saying, gaps and problems there, right? And my play doy was to invest less in transformative agreements and to invest more in real open access uh, journals. So on that, we are exactly yes, on the same that, line. I mean, transformative agreements are, are an intermediate solution. We have to go to a different solution as of 2024, uh, pure publish, or what we call pure publish deals. We are in a transitional situation and the situation is not perfect i i agree i agree on that but that's true for every transitional uh, uh, transitional situation i mean you you know you see problems you try to solve them you move ahead and that that's what we're doing that's we're doing what we're doing at nwo that's we're doing what we're doing with with the coalition so, so we are we are using multiple routes to realize open access Johan, uh, so this only works if the whole world is with us. And so well, I mean, I, I see the whole world shifting towards that. If, if Springer Nature does this, no, no, I, let me finish. I, so, so if we if we start an open access journal ourselves, but all the Americans and Chinese don't publish in there, and we are only publishing in these our own journals, then there is this uh, dividing worlds of science which we don't want. We want to have our postdocs, our physicians going abroad and vice versa for, for optimal learning. And we should not have the publishing agreements or whatever the strategies being a block for, for, for open science. And so it should help. And for, for these type of plans, it's really important that everyone- I understand what you're saying, but this is a temporary problem. It's, it's a problem of a transition. And I also note, for instance, that Cypos, which is a journal published in Amsterdam at your university, I believe. Cypos is a perfect example of an a very successful open access journal that's being supported by NWO and by other institutions, uh, coalition, coalition as funders, and that is doing very well in open access and attracting submissions from all over the world. So a new world is possible. We just have to get out there and do it. But Johan, could you say a bit more about this international dimension? Because it is coming up in many of the questions that we also have. This is, this is also what I said about, I mean, look, the, the very fact that there is this, um, uh, this uh, OSTP uh, re request for information on, on, uh, on whether or not uh, federally funded research should be, should be an open access. The very fact that there is such a request and that this is being considered is, I believe, a result of the Americans looking at Coalition S and looking at Planet and seeing that there is something there that they should act upon. The very fact that China is changing its rewards and incentive system, is reinforcing their own journals, is an indication that they are planning a move. For me, it's not so much 
not so much necessarily a matter of the USA and China joining Plan S as if membership were the only solution. For me, it's much more, can we see whether these countries are aligning their policies with what we are doing? And I think that that is the case. Maybe it's not as fast as we would like in coalition S, but you, you do see the world changing. If a major publisher like Springer Nature changes uh, their policy radically and makes the radical decision to go for open access. If Cambridge University Press has decided to radically move to open access by 2026, those are indications that we cannot ignore. This is where the world is going. And what about Germany, if I may? Because Germany, Germany is a something. difficult question. Germany has, as it is also aligned, I would say. Germany has chosen for various reasons, historical reasons, and also having to do with the constitution and the right, uh, the, the freedom of publication that they uh, cherish for, for all sorts of historical reasons. They have, they have chosen to go the transformative agreement route and they have, a, they have uh, organized this via the Max Planck Institute and via OA 2020. And, uh, and by OA 2020, the organization that is realizing these transformative uh, agreements in Germany. And Germany is quite tough. I mean, Germany is, for instance, very tough on Elsevier. They still don't have an agreement with Elsevier, and they seem to be doing quite well. So again, these are policies that I see as being aligned with Coalition S. Even though not formally supported? Even, even they are not formally members, right? I mean, we, we, we should not be blind, I just think, is this country, yes or no, a member of Coalition S? We should look, have a much wider perspective and see, are these policies changing towards the goals of Coalition S? And when I look at this broad playing field, that is what I'm seeing. Okay, let's, oh, Fritz, go ahead. So now if we go back to Earth, um, I'm sure you did a SWOT this analysis. Earth, I mean. So what is the what is this is all fantastic? And uh, what is the worst case analysis? What are the threats? What if it, how can it go wrong? Or do we all believe because transitions are fantastic and temporary is fantastic? And I, I I must say I believe in that. But on the other hand, we have seen transitions that took forever and temporary that took forever. So is there a worst case analysis? A worst case analysis? Yeah, you have a plan. Then you have. You, you do a SWOT analysis, you look what the threats are, the weaknesses, you look what the danger is that it goes wrong. So what are the dangers here? Yeah, of course, of course there are dangers. I think one of the dangers is that uh, publishers will keep, will keep trying to push the prices up. That is something that we are seeing that we are concerned about. That is definitely something that is, that, that is on our minds. That's why we have the price transparency requirement that by 2022, everybody will be able to compare prices we are not 100% sure that that is going to work, but we want to make people more conscious about the costs of publishing and also the unjustified costs of publishing. But that is a threat, yes, is it going to cost more? The threat is also, will people from lower and middle income countries be able to pay and how will they participate? That is also something that we're trying to address. This is something that Wim asked a minute ago, what do you do with those authors? Right now, as Stan said, the, these authors receive waivers, but very often these waivers are viewed as being patronizing, as, a, as handouts. Mm -hmm. So what we, would, um, what we would like to do within Coalition S is to set up a conversation with publishers and with libraries worldwide to see how we can address this. For instance, by tying payments for academic publishing, maybe not to APCs, but to other paying mechanisms and certainly to uh, purchasing power parity. Uh, for instance, for aspirin, you don't pay the same, or for Coca-Cola, you don't pay the same price in Oslo in, or in New Delhi either, right? I mean, there are prices that are being set, set worldwide for these in terms of tiers. Uh, I know that this is the case for medicine. I mean, I don't think I need to explain this to well, you. The, pri the, price of, the price of medicine is the worst example possible on earth. But I, I see what you mean. Possibly, but we have to move in. <laughs> we have to so, sort of, uh, yeah, but you know, you see what, you see what I mean. I mean, we have yes, to make, sure. A, a, a system that is globally fair so that everybody can participate as a function of their, their purchasing power. That, that's what I think we need to move towards. And again, I mean, you know, this is not built in one year. This is something that needs years of preparation, but we need to try and move to this fair world. Um, We're on Earth. <laughs> Wim, can I? Uh, go ahead, Sam. It's about uh, the quality of it, the journals. It has been uh, uh, raised a few times. Um, of course, we want to publish in excellent uh, journals. Um, the the uh, predatory journal 
journals. I think are not a problem for Plan S. I think any decent scientist, if you want to make a career in science, if you are proud on your results, you should not publish your results in a proprietary journal. Um, and so I would say, um, of course, we will have people who are, will uh, make uh, uh, disabuse about the situation, whatever you do. Um, but I would say the fact that there are predatory journals, if you're a serious scientist, you should go for a decent journal. You won't have a good review, uh, referee process. And about the other issue about the quality, um, that was referred to the, say, the, the development on uh, uh, incentives and rewards of scientists. If the one we've, if, uh, we all know that nature and science in these high impact journals don't have a, a flat distribution. Uh, that's it, don't, not all the journals have the same number of citations. Um, there's a very a strange distribution of citations to nature and science papers. So the fact that you have a paper in science or nature doesn't say anything. Um, so what you have to look what you really, what was your contribution? What was uh, the impact of your journal that can be measured in many different ways? Citations is one of them. But I think that's not a part of the Plan S discussion. That's part of a way broader discussion on how we uh, recognize the contribution of uh, staff members at Dutch universities. But I can assure you that the pressure on scientists, staff members of Dutch universities is equally large in many other uh, countries, at least in Europe. And so the uh, development on incentives and awards is not just a typical Dutch development. It's a development which is going on in Europe uh, very broad. And I would say Plan S is part of that, but that definitely is not equivalent to a Plan S. There's time for, yes, Birgit, there's time for one more short issue and then we'll unfortunately have to close. Go ahead. Uh, turn on the mic. I just want to say, of course, we are here not to discuss Plan S. Uh, and that could be a long discussion and a very fundamental discussion. We have had that, but we discussed the implementation. And I'm very interested to hear from Stan to what extent some of the things he heard here from us might make NWO uh, perhaps transform uh, the Beleids document as it is there, or will all what we uh, try to bring forward in thinking along constructively, as I think the four of us did, will it have not have any impact? on the implementation document? That is for me the burning question, actually. Well, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I was distracted well, by my the, wife. What the influence here? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, at the very beginning, I mentioned Birgit, yes. Um, so we promised the Dutch scientists that we would announce any major change in the system at least six months before the, the start. Um, for various reasons, we couldn't organize this meeting earlier. So, but I, at the very beginning of this meeting, I, I told you that we will take uh, the comments uh, quite seriously. Um, and we will try to, let's say, uh, uh, to incorporate comments that we think are serious and should, uh, and are, uh, uh, improve the implementation of Plan S. We will take them seriously, we will implement them. That's why I would ask you whether, um, we could have the, all the questions available to NWO after all, because I have to work in parallel, uh, hearing the presentations and reading all the questions. Uh, so I can promise you we'll take this serious. And actually, um, well, if possible, I would uh, try to deal with these comments in the same way as we did at the consultation, uh, give a short summary on how we, whether we will respond to that, and if so, how. Indeed, Stan, I can promise that you'll get all the questions and the answers that have been given so far also. Uh, the, these are collected. They will not disappear if we close the session and they'll, we'll make sure that they get to you. Um, if I may also as a way of closing, uh, and I think that ties in with the uh, issue that Fritz brought up, it's not a situation where you say, yes, we go and then you close your eyes for a couple of years. My feeling is many people in some sense are sympathetic to trying to go this route, but it's with still, there are many questions around and things can change as Fritz was stressing. Would it be an option that we 
say in a year or so from now, see where we are, see how things are going so that there's still room to, well, if things don't work out, I mean, maybe not yet a plan B, but if things are not going as fast as, as we had hoped, if, if, the U, um, if the US is not going along, that, that there's still room to somehow, well, postpone certain things, or, or is that an, a, a possibility to, to go ahead? Well, I'm not quite sure about, uh, I mean, Joran should respond from the coalition S, but uh, from my point of view, well, NWO, we are, well, you may have not noticed it, but we have developed a plan to evaluate uh, the performance of NWO, not only regarding plan S, but also on our financial instruments. Uh, of course, evaluation, you have to, let's say, take some time to evaluate. But uh, from my perspective, it would be fine to have another meeting like this in one year from now, uh, to see where we are, uh, which progress we have made, and which problems we have we have uh, faced, uh, and what the problems will be by then. Okay, I think with that I'll close. I can't speak on behalf of the uh, Royal Academy, but I can speak. I, I do know that uh, I'm very sure that my successor is very much willing to organize a meeting like this in a year or so from now, and I'm very happy to hear that uh, Stanis would be or, or his successor would probably or would uh, also be willing to, to share the thoughts. And also, Johan, you'll be then invited back and presumably and we'll have for questions. Yes. And I guess you will understand that I don't think uh, we'll have trouble finding people that are willing to speak from the four domains to, to think with you and to, to come up with critical questions. There's still about 37 unanswered questions. So, um, Working on it, Swim. Working yes. on it. <laughs> well, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for joining. Thanks in particular to Stan and Johan, but also to our four, uh, uh, our four colleagues from the four domains. Um, we hope to uh, see you back uh, after the, the summer. And I wish NWO good luck with the implementation plan. And we hope to see a few of the elements that were coming up back in the final version. Thanks a lot. Thanks for hosting. Thank you for inviting us.